Hi, Dr. Biology here, and this video is the classification of living things. So it's in GCSE Biology, and it's also in Combined Science Biology as well. And it's in the, the main topic is inheritance, variation, and evolution. So what I'll be talking about is um, understanding how living things are classified into groups, find out about scientists who discovered these systems, and to help you um, learn the binomial naming system. Mm -hmm. So firstly, the question we need to ask is, how many species are there on Earth? Well, you'd think that was a simple question, but it is actually very hard to answer. The fact is, we simply don't know. In the scientific literature, the current estimates for the number of species on Earth ranges between 5.3 million and 1 trillion. However, um, since around about 2011, most scientists would agree that the number of species on each level of what we call biological classification is around 8.7 million species. Now this uh, diagram shows the relative, relative numbers of the named species and the key thing you can see there is that the vast majority of species on this planet are invertebrates, the insects, um, and they make up a large proportion of what is on Earth. So here are some of the main groups. So invertebrates, about 1.4 million estimated numbers of species, and that's 80% of the total. Vertebrates make up 62,000 of described species, and that's only 3%. We are part of the vertebrates. And then plants, 310,000 estimated number of described species, and that's about 17%. So um, due to the vast number of species, um, if you're studying the species of the planet, then you're going to have to classify them into certain groups. And these groups need to be understood by scientists who live um, around the world in different countries with different languages. And therefore, you need a classification system. So before scientists can estimate the number of species, we've got to agree to a definition of what is a species. And there are, the definition currently states that a species is a name for a group of organisms all with similar characteristics. And members of the same species can breed with each other to produce living, fertile offspring. So... Um, all living things can be grouped, and as it says here, but why bother? Well, as it, I said earlier, it makes them easier to study, allows us to make sense of our living world, helps us understand how living things are related, how humans are related as well to every other living thing on this planet, and it also gives scientists a common language in which to talk about it. But who came up with the first classification system? Well, this will be Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist. He's born in 1707, died in 1778. So he had a very good long life uh, for that era. So it uh, began with him. He started to group things together based on their structure and characteristics. So he made very careful observations, as many scientists did in those days. And they classified organisms into what we call a hierarchical structure. So Linnaeus classified living things into different groupings, um, and these were kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now for your exam, you're going to have to learn that order, so I'm going to give you some help with that in a minute. But here's an example. So this is related to the lion. So the lion is, uh, the Latin name is Panthera leo, and the kingdom is Animalia which means all animals. Phylum is the chordata, which means that they have a backbone. Class is mammalia, so mammals, the same as us, we're mammals. Uh, they have fur, we don't have fur, but we do feed young on milk. And then carnivora, so they just eat meat, so they're carnivores. And then the family is philidae, which means retractable claws. And genus, panthera, means they can roar, and their species is Leo. 
Now, in the exam, you wouldn't be expected to learn any examples like that. But what you would be expected to do is use information that they give you um, to work out the answer. But you would need to know these things. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. Now, as you can see in this diagram, that uh, we have similarities to the lion in terms of we're animalia, uh, we are chordata, we are vertebrates, we are mammals, mammalia, but this is where it changes. So the order is primates, family is hem hominidae, genus, the grouping that we are, is homo, and our species, sapiens. So we're known as homo sapiens. A really good way to learn this hierarchical structure is through using mnemonics. So um, one of my favourites uh, is, ba well, first of all, a mnemonic is where you take the first letter of each word and you can then use different words to try and remember it. So, uh, for example, my favourite one is king prawn curry or fat greasy sausage. But you can come up with your own ideas in terms of remembering that order just makes it easier to remember the order um, of the different structures or groups. So in terms of naming species, this is a very useful system. Um, it also allows the fact that um, people can actually describe what organism they're looking at, what species that they're looking at. So the first thing is they use Latin. Um, so Latin is not a common language and the reason it's been chosen is that so no nation would be offended. Um, every organism has two names. So, for example, our first name, Homo, okay, is the, is the genus. So it's a bit like our surname. And then um, the species name is Sapiens. So Homo sapien. So, like our first name, but cannot be shared with any other species. So, we are, our binomial name for humans is Homo sapien. So, what comes first is genus, then species. Now, there are some rules in terms of using genus and species. And basically, the first word, genus, always has a capital letter. And the second word, which is the species, is always written with a smaller letter. Latin names are always written in italics or they are usually underlined. So as you can see, here are the group of Panthera. So genus of Panthera. So you can see the capital letter there. And then Pardus is the species. So, and you, um, so that's the leopard. Then you've got the tiger, Panthera tigris. And then you've got Panthera onca, which is the jaguar. Now, Linnaeus, he lived in the 18th century. So then when he devised his system, there were far fewer known species. And he just suggested two main kingdoms, which was plants and animals. Now, as you know from the, your work in cell biology, you, you'll know that um, there was a lot of more evidence of internal structures in different cells and tissues due to the improvements of microscopes, the understanding of biochemical processes kept progressing, and new models were um, devised. So um, we then moved to using the five kingdoms. So the five kingdoms are animals, plants, fungi, prokaryotes and protists. Now this was further subdivided by uh, Professor Carl Woese who analysed DNA and RNA. So this is quite a modern method of classification and he came up with the three domains of life. So you have bacteria, archaea, which is a type of prokaryote, and eukarya, which includes protists, fungi, plants and animals. So he developed this system based on DNA evidence. So archaea are primitive bacteria, usually living in extreme environments. Bacteria are the true bacteria. And eukaryota are the things like protists, fungi, plants and animals. 
Through his research, he found that there were some really surprising relationships. So here we have two elephant species, so the African and uh, Asian F elephants. Their closest relative is the rock hyrax. So whilst they don't look very similar, uh, their genetic uh, DNA is quite similar and they both, for example, um, they both have tusks growing from their incisor teeth and also um, they share with elephants in terms of uh, having flattened hoof-like nails on the tips of their toes. So another one, uh, dolphins and whales are closely related but they're uh, particularly related to Hippos. Another surprising relationship, rhinos are closely related to horses. So in terms of all this data, uh, scientists can use evolutionary trees and these are methods used to show how they believe organisms are related. So they use current classification data for living organisms, but also they can use the fossil data as well of extinct organisms. So they can show how um, certain species may have evolved. Uh, Darwin used this as a way to group organisms. However, at that time he didn't know about genes and therefore couldn't um, make the connections that we can these days with our knowledge of DNA. In an exam they will show you different types of diagrams. So this diagram shows the evolution of a group called the primates. First thing to say is that you start off with the oldest period, so many millions of years ago down here, and this means that it's getting more to the present day. So this is the present day here. Um, what you'll notice as well is um, that the lower down you can work out which primate uh, evolved first. In this case, it was the lemur. And you can also see, for example, if we look at human, we can actually uh, look at what are the two primates that developed most recently from the same common ancestor as the human. So if we look at this line here, we can see that on that line you have gorillas and then more recently chimpanzees. This evolutionary tree shows um, a tree for humans and the diagram is based on the study of fossils and you'll notice that they, in the exam they've given you the different uh, millions of years and one of the questions states when did Australopithecus afarensis first appear? So what we need to do is, is find that first of all so there it is there okay but we also we need to read the um, scale because the scale for Australopithecus afarensis is quite wide so it goes from there to there and the basically when did it first appear well it would first appear on the bottom of that line there so we need to feed it across now obviously it's between three and four million years so we've got to estimate so uh, the answer is actually 3.75 but they would accept 3.6 to 3.9 million years ago. So that's another style of question they might ask you. This next evolutionary tree is for some Galapagos finches and again they give you the um, kind of general how many millions year, million of years ago and present day and then they say that they had a common ancestor finch from the mainland and then the type of question could be which type of present day finch is least closely related to all the others? So least closely. So we need to go through all the finches. So I'm going to go actually from, from here. So you can see woodpecker finch is related to the mangrove finch. You can then look at the large tree finch. You can see well it's related to the medium tree finch. And the small tree finch um, is related to both the medium tree finch and the large tree finch. Now the only one that is, is not related to all the others 
of the present day finches but are related to the common ancestor is the vegetarian finch and that would be the answer. So also they might have some letters on there and um, this shows the different branching points. Now a question here would be for example which branch branching point P, Q, R or S on the diagram above shows the most recent common ancestor of all the tree finches. So the tree finches. So you need to find the trees, well the tree finches, that one that one and that one. So what we need to do is feed back from the evolutionary tree and we can find when the most common ancestor was. Um, and you can see small tree finches. So basically it's where it branches between the small tree and the medium and large tree finches, which is R. And then a final question would be something like which two finches have the most recent common ancestors? So again, what we're going to need to do is look at the present day and we can see, well, it's not going to be that one. Um, it's not going to be that one. That one is quite low. They're quite related. But if you see a more recent um, uh, common ancestor is the mangrove finch and the woodpecker finch. So the answer would be P. So a couple of tips here. So um, on an evolutionary tree, the further something is up the evolutionary tree, the more recently it branched from the other species on the tree. And secondly, species, species which are more closely related are closer on the tree. So here's a question, so which is the most closest related animal to the human? Well, the human is there, so we need to look at which branch is closest, and that would be the green monkey. And then it says, which animal is a close relative of both the camel and deer? So camel and the deer, so what we need to do is go back in the evolutionary tree, and the first thing that branches is the pig. So whilst fossils are really useful, what is the best way to classify animals is using DNA evidence. This can also be used to see how long ago different organisms had a similar ancestor, so how closely they are related. A classic example is the red and giant panda, because both eat bamboo, both have a wrist thumb, so it does look like they're related. However, if we look at the evolutionary tree, we can see that their common ancestor was way back. And they actually split at an early time many, many millions of years ago. So based on the evidence, on their DNA, sorry, giant pandas are more closely related to bears and red pandas to raccoons. OK, so I'm going to show you some exam questions. So what I suggest you do is when I show the questions, you pause, you have a go at the answers and then um, press play. OK, press pause. And press pause. So this brings us to the end of the classification video. Please do subscribe for some more videos which will include all the content for your GCSE biology exam. Thanks for listening and see you soon.